Okay, uh, so uh, trying to think about this, I wasn't going to get into a whole bunch of numbers, but if my dates are wrong, and even if my names are wrong, um, just remember Will Rogers, don't let, a good, don't let the facts get in front of a good story, okay? <laughs> on this, but I thought I would start a little bit in a context so we can understand the types of buildings and the problems that we were faced when we decided to basically pull away from uh, the Central City Development Corporation and kind of stand on our own for a while because of the fear of demolition uh, when Ernie Hahn came here. But remember, Ernie Hahn is also another father of downtown redevelopment and making it happen and taking that that real chance uh, to do that. So I'm going to start off, I'm gonna throw some things up here uh, just to give you in a context, and then I'm gonna do a little bit of an architect speak on it uh, because there were some, what I consider some real trigger points, some milestones uh, that was either gonna make or break uh, the quarter on it. And um, when I did start my business down here, I really wasn't thinking about historic preservation. Uh, I had just come back uh, from the University of Glasgow. I got my master's in long span tension structures, working with Fry Auto in the 1970s Munich, Munich games um, and stuff. So I really wasn't focused on that. I just happened to get backed into it. And, uh, and before it was really a profession that you studied, the only place that you could really go, I'm not going to say uh, Gavana and, and in the uh, University of Illinois, but uh, uh, there was very few places that you could actually study historic preservation and it really wasn't focused in the architectural realm at that. So a lot of this was trial and error. Uh, some of the stuff I did in the beginning was horrible when you look at it now, but it was great back then for whatever reason. Okay. And, uh, and so, so we still keep maturing. I was just happened to look uh, at this a few years ago and it really irritated me. Uh, not so much that it's Center City Development Corporation revitalizing downtown and stuff, uh, but this is a 2010 report, and as you know, of course, we do not have any uh, CCDCs anymore um, on this. And I can, and I think Michael can probably back me up on this and Tom Hom, if we did not have CCDC, I don't think we could have made this work, quite frankly. Uh, okay, next. So, in the heart of San Diego, uh, 16 and a half blocks. The reason why you have that one block there is Alex Cannell that used to run the uh, uh, Royal Pie Bakery, I think it was. And uh, he insisted that he wanted to be in the gas lamp quarter, uh, which is cool because this is the only block in the gas lamp quarter in the beginning that had the five globe lights on both sides of the street, which really confuses a lot of people, besides Fifth Avenue, of course. Next. Okay, so then it says, create great public spaces. And it really irritated me. There's no great public space here that we have in, that was San Diego, so next. And then this is the major catalyst. These three developments, Horton Plaza, of course, with John Jurdy and Ernie Hahn, Petco Park, and um, the Convention Center. Um, but there's no gas lamp quarter. And that's a crime, because I think we were the greatest I think for sure we were the catalyst that made these guys come down here because you know they did that 90 degree switch. So, okay, next. All right, so here's the real granddad, Alonzo E. Horton. And uh, I think it's, it's interesting that in 1867 when he decided to come down here and create the new town, let's go to the next one. When he decided to come here, at the, at the end of Fifth Avenue, there's a whole bunch of different wharfs, most of them tied in with uh, the railroad at that time. As you know, the big boom that we happened in 1887 when the railroad came here, uh, and that boom didn't last very long. But at this time, you had the steam ships um, and the sales, and the cargo and everything else. And I've been working with Ray Ashley. We're working on a World Heritage Site nomination dealing with 35 vessels. The Star of India is one of them uh, worldwide on it. So, it's rather interesting, a, a lot of the studies that we have in these early years of tying and moving the cargo in order to make it. Next. Okay, so this is sort of the street scene that we would have, oh, somewhere about 1890s. 
Now, I'm sure all of you know out there, we never had any gas lamps. <laughs> Didn't exist, okay? Uh, this was sort of an invention, I think, by Robert Hofstetter. At least he drew up some of this stuff in the early days. He was a designer uh, on it. But we had these really cool high tension lights that were up there. And it lit the street a lot better than the gas lamps, but of course with Mount Palomar and other folks, we wouldn't be able to do that today. But I think what's important is that we had streetcars being pulled by horses at the time. And when you look at the livelihood of the, built, of the buildings here, you will find as I'm going through this, is that a lot of the buildings that were brought into San Diego were brought by design from other places. Uh, for instance, the San Diego hardware store was a building in Chicago, exactly the same shape, the size, three stories, and all of it uh, when it was brought in here. Next. We also have the Stingery District. A lot of people talk about the Stingery as though it's still existing today. And I can assure you it's not in the gas lamp quarter right now, but I think I know where it is. <laughs> um, anyway, 138 women were rounded up. Uh, in 1912, most of them sent to, uh, up to Los Angeles, and a lot of them, I think, made their way back. But it's interesting that the Stingery, um, I'm not sure what, what you want to call it, the, the fact of the part that it was the Stingery and all the ladies, I think, has still grown today, and I know a lot of people really push that uh, out. So next. All right, Fifth Avenue. Uh, the George Keating building, uh, one of the coolest buildings going. Again, you can see the track lines. Um, one of the things that we find also is that a lot of the buildings in the gas uh, also have imported materials. During the turn of the century, uh, if you looked at the landscape that was here, uh, and especially even before the Panama California Exposition, it was what you would see if you drove through Camp Pendleton without the trees. And there was nothing there. Wood was a premium. Uh, this is one reason why we moved so many buildings in San Diego uh, instead of getting them. And for instance, all of the stones that are here uh, are from Ballast Point. Uh, the Ballast Point out there had these large granite stones. Some of them even had the weight chiseled into them. And they were to load primarily the clipper ships, of course, when they came in and left. So they unloaded the stones out at Ballast Point, and then when they were ready to leave, they trimmed out the ship. And if you notice all the papers that's over at uh, in the William Heath Davis house, those were also used to line uh, all the gutters that was here. And also we had large granite pieces that were the curbs uh, through the gas lamp quarter. And many of those are still there now, I hope. I think they are. There's some of them there, including a lot of them that had horse rings that were drilled in and set in there so you could tie your horse up at curbside. Uh, so a lot of these materials uh, were actually imported. Uh, what a grand building, huh? Next. By the way, go back one more. You're going to see a, a later one where this is all painted white, the whole thing. It's, uh, it's hard to believe people do that. Next. All right, and Spreckles, besides doing the, uh, his streetcar system, uh, especially in 1886 and then coming back to electric, also then would run and do other projects uh, to, to tie all the streetcars together, like the roller coaster out in Mission Beach. Now, the interesting point is that when we finally moved into the upstairs of the San Diego hardware, there were these long benches along the wall, and we found out that that was a dance floor. And when you look at the way that they put the oak floor in, the oak floor wasn't straight, it was in a kind of a square pattern, so that as you were moving around, you are always going with the flow of the wood. So in case it came up, you weren't going to trip. And we kind of asked ourselves that, and so we started to remodel, and we found an incredible amount of oriental fans. I don't know whether they're Japanese or Chinese. Uh, I think we still have them today. They're gorgeous. And, uh, so, and when, but we found a lot of tickets. And a lot of tickets were tickets to get out to not only Mission Beach, but part of the other land areas that Spreckles was selling at that time. So it was a real great network that we had at that time. And during the early years, next, we were also thinking about putting the streetcar through. In fact, the Ga Gaslamp Gazette, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, 
uh, with Jerry Lebonnecke was really pushing to get the streetcars back. And we actually did some investigation, found the rails were still underneath the street, although probably not usable, but still underneath the street. Okay, so until this time, we really didn't have very many people uh, that were in, uh, in San Diego until we had the uh, 1915 Panama, California Exposition. What happened, let's go to the next slide. What this promoted was the first time, and thank you so much for this slide, David. This is, this is one of the coolest slides. Is with the opening of the Panama Canal and tying the nations together. And I'm not going to go through that whole story because you all know it. But it had a major impact on what we know now as, as the gas lamp, gas lamp quarter. Next. And we then started to import a whole bunch of architects and a whole bunch of architecture that we had. Now, what does that building remind you of? U.S. Grant. US Grant. Okay. So, same architect, but when he decided to build the U.S. Grant, when he was asked by Spreckles to come next, there you go. So, I think it's kind of unique that all these buildings now were kind of focusing on where we were going next, especially with the Panama, California Exposition because of the, of the folks coming in. You notice the streetcars are now electrified and going, and of course our favorite little uh, uh, Horton Plaza. <clears throat> Not the Horton Plaza. Next. Okay, so we were about ready to change our image. And the image that we we're changing to uh, prior to the exposition was to come back and do either mission revival or Spanish colonial revival. Uh, it was important that we sort of captured this phase as the architecture by Goodhue was going. So even though we had our great Victorian station that at this time I believe was only about um, 17 years old, we decided to tear it down because that was not the image that we wanted to have visitors coming to San Diego. We wanted to capture the very romantic period um, of the Spanish colonial revival and the, and the mission revival. So, as we were preparing for our California Exposition, this is a film in 1912. And you'll notice when you start looking that this building is under construction. All you see is the concrete walls and the hollow clay tile infill. This is the, the Watts building. You'll notice that it's still got scaffolding and X bracing and stuff in it. So everybody was then very strongly prepared because Fifth Avenue was going to be the major corridor at that time going up to the park. Uh, it also had the streetcars that were electrified and loading through. Now, one of the problems that we ran into at that time, though, was that the southern portion, and if you look at the Callan Hotel, uh, for instance, if you go out here and you just walk down the block, you'll see some Chinese characters underneath the Callan Hotel. Uh, this was probably the most diverse neighborhood that we had. Uh, besides a lot of uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, we also had um, a lot of uh, African American groups, I mean, when you really look at a lot of the pictures in, in Mike's book that he put together on the gas lamp quarter, you'll notice how diverse it was. While there's a lot of folks that felt that that wasn't such a great deal, is to go through the southern portion from the wharfs coming up until you got up to this area. And a lot of people were relocated. And in fact, I remember when I was first starting the office, I was still in Marilyn Marx's building, I was wondering to know why, as a large city on the Pacific Rim, that we don't have a major Chinatown, major Japantown, Koreatown, or anything that really has any resemblance of that. And I'm going to embarrass Tom pretty soon here. But, um, but anyway, I think, I think it's interesting that all of this building in 1912 was on the expectation of the Panama, California um, Exposition. And everything else. Uh, okay, next. All right, right about this time, 
1966 uh, was the National Historic Preservation Act uh, under the Johnson administration enacted because of a lot of the federal projects that were being done throughout the country or on federal property or using federal funds uh, were really crunching a building. It really started in the Eisenhower era, uh, especially with the building of the freeways and going through in every major town that you go through, including San Diego, you'll notice how the freeway just sort of winds through. You go San Bernardino, you go Los Angeles, San Francisco, and these freeways uh, were probably done in the, in the areas where the people had very little political power. Uh, they were cheaper areas. It was the right of intimate domain and come through and crunch it. So there was a group that was created, which was California's for Preservation Action, that later became the California uh, Preservation Foundation. And it was a group, and they had their first conference in Sacramento in 1980. Next. All right, so we were then told in the gas lamp quarter uh, that there was a, a, a great uh, developer, Ernie Hahn, uh, who did uh, uh, Passion Valley and other places and, and uh, was going to come downtown and provide uh, a cure for a lot of the older developments and everything else. And there was a lot of fearfulness at that time, next. There was a lot of fearfulness at that time that we would lose buildings in the gas lamp quarter as well. And by the way, when I say we, it's kind of collective, we. It's not just a few people, it's, it's a lot of people. Uh, so like the Cabrillo Theater, uh, sure enough, uh, we lost that. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that during this, this period is that we were so fearful of doing this, and this is where Tom Hom really came as a city council member uh, and was really anxious to try to save this. Now, most of the time, we didn't know really what we are doing. We didn't even know how big the shopping center was going to be, but I remember going to a presentation, uh, I think it was by John Jurdy, and he was mentioning that Horton Plaza will not succeed unless the anchor stores are so large, you have to have so many other stores, you've got to have a parking component, and it's going to require X number of uh, blocks in order to do that. Next. So we were anxious and kind of worried that this would then spill over. Um, so in, in order to make sure that we would not lose these things, and I think it was Tom that was mostly instrumental in this, is that we then wanted to try to incorporate and get the gas lamp quarter uh, called out as a historic district. Now, what this would do then is it would put it back into the National Historic Preservation Act in order for using any kind of money, uh, like block grant funds to do sidewalks, to do lighting, uh, or anything like this, uh, to put it out. Now, this was 1980 that it was put on the register. Now, what makes that so unique and so different for the gas lamp quarter is that we found now that we had about 120 buildings that were uh, basically um, as contributors to the district. Not that they would stand alone by themselves, but that as a coherent group, they would be then as contributors. Next. Okay, so one thing that we found is when we started with the gas lamp quarter, this is sort of what it looked like. I mean, it was kind of dingy. Uh, you can see almost adult film centers. I can't remember how many porn shops we had. I think we probably had at least over 30, uh, plus or minus. We had three rescue missions. Um, so we had to figure out how we're going to uh, deal with this. And for a lot of the buildings on the upper floors, they were completely vacant. And they were vacant because they had code problems and initiation. Now, this was one year before the Tax Recovery Act came in, in 1981. Uh, so we were doing something before that didn't really make an economic stimulus at that time, except to try to save the buildings. Uh, I love that dirty dinga Maggie. Uh, also at this time, you could buy your 1500 uh, milliliter uh, fortified wine, 
uh, Thunderbird. Um, help me out with some of the others. You guys drink all that stuff, right? <laughs> no, it wasn't Gallo. Yeah, Midnight Express, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, next. All right, let's go back one. Let's go back one. Let's go back one. Also, you'll notice uh, these Cobra lights that were here in the gas lamp quarter. That's the way it was written, because we'll revisit that. Next. All right, at night, things go gauged up. Next. Also part of the old Aztecs, but you're, you're going to see uh, money to loan and all that. Boy, this is blurry. Next. Uh, and then you're also going to see a lot of signage uh, and leave it out. And I saw these in the historic drawings. And Frank Kern, uh, when he was mayor, uh, he gave me a call. And uh, we we're just talking in general. He says, I got a great notebook that I want to show you. And I don't know if we still have that or not. But it's a great notebook because all of these signs that were sticking out of the building, as you got the sign from the corner building, as you started to go towards the middle of the block, each of the signs got bigger and bigger and stuck out further so that you could see it. So it was like a big old tripod. So when he was mayor, he says, boy, that's really ugly. And he took the signs and turned them and plastered them flat against the building. So we started with a lot of signs when we were starting to take them down afterwards is that they're double-faced neon. We're going, wow, this is kind of cool. So next. Loans, great place to come, money to buy. I'm not sure why would you take money and buy money, but anyway, go ahead, next. All right, and a lot of the other theaters. The reason why I show this is that when we decided to put the quarter on the National Register, we were primarily looking in 1980 buildings that are 50, old, 50 years or older. So the period of significance stopped right around 1930. So a lot of the deco buildings that, that were in the mid-1930s and 1935 and stuff like this were left off of the National Register. Uh, we had to amend the National Register and years later to make sure that we captured all of these so we could take advantage of the historic tax credits. But look at the great names. Uh, Prairie Stranger. All right. Next. All right. Next. But we had some really nice, nice storefronts. Um, a lot that had uh, terrazzo floors in them that were very nice, and, and they were not too bad. Next. OK, so here's Tom, Tom's neighborhood here. Um, one of the problems that we had is that some of the areas was not in the gas lamp quarter. And so Tom led the charge, especially with the Chinese Benevolent Building that we got in the part of the half block and stuff. I'm going to embarrass you. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether Robert Hostick, I think he did come up with this logo and the design, and it became really the marching symbol. I think you, made that design. Did he? Okay. Well, you, you look like that today, huh? All right. Next. Okay, so when, when we started, uh, when I started down here, I was speaking with Marilyn Jane, uh, Jean Marks. Uh, they came, but they couldn't stay for the presentation. And it was just super, super great with them. This was the Lester Hotel. And uh, well, there's kind of a side entrance over here that's kind of hard to see. And uh, I tried to make it with one of my pals that I graduated with from... Uh, from college, and uh, that didn't that lasted for about a year. It didn't work out too well. Uh, so then was sort of on 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 my own, I guess. And uh, Marilyn took me in and gave me a room about 20 by 20 feet with a skylight overhead, and charged me 35 dollars per month for rent, which is great, including electricity and all that. Next. 1978. 1978. Yes, 1978. So. Uh, one of the things that she started was a gas lamp quarter gazette. And I was talking with Lori, my wife, and I, I showed Marilyn this. And I, I just focused on this. This is volume one, number one, is the very first one. And she made 5,000 of these copies. And I think they're probably still around. But she signed it. And then she put one out of 5,000. Isn't that cool? Oh, so it's a great little saver on that. But uh, I couldn't even afford $35. 
So uh, what she had me do is write these thumbnail tours here. And this was from deep purple to deep throat. And I would write these tours and then, and then, do, a, and then do a sketch on how we think we could fix this up and stuff. And of course, that, this is right at the end of F Street, I think, 4th and F. And uh, we wanted to save that building in place. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where you drive into the parking lot for the Horton Grand Hotel. In fact, Mike has always said that uh, the garage was done is that Horton Plaza continues to moon us all the time. Okay. Next. All right, so there were some examples, like in Portland, uh, gas light uh, district that had the different globes and everything else that seemed to be really great. Uh, we took several trips up there uh, looking at how great these things work. Isn't that beautiful? And this was uh, happening at, this, at the time that we were thinking about doing this with the gas lamp quarter. So we knew it could be done if we could entice the right uh, people to come down. Next. OK, so a lot of the earlier buildings, the first architects actually that came down here uh, was Al Macy and John Henderson. Um, Al bought this building. I wanted to buy it from him when he was ready to sell it, but I couldn't. He just made the offer just incredibly stupid. So I didn't do it. But now Heritage Architecture is in there today. So finally coming back to it. M Marshall Sewell, of course, bought it, and she lived there for a while. And she still has her businesses down below. Uh, but these are just great buildings. Uh, unreinforced brick masonry, next. So we started off trying to do events. And the reason why I brought all these posters is I've been saving them all these years. And I have a chance now to throw them up and so you can look at them. So it's interesting that um, uh, we started to do fundraisers. And next one. And of course, that's Bud Fisher and Francie Mortensen, Chris Mortensen's wife. Uh, dressed up, and they just loved it. I think they probably had an affair going at some time, but you never know. All right. Next. So we started getting all these great celebrations, um, like this poster and stuff. We had uh, preservation week going from during May. You notice this is 1989. There's a 1980 poster over here. Uh, so, and then we gave tours. Um, contractors gave tours, like Michael Mijos. Uh, I gave a backyards and basement tours. These were buildings that had still been sealed up. And you could go into, for instance, uh, some of the buildings, and you would see a lot of the Chinese gambling dens that were still there, the tables, everything. Just almost, almost, but not quite as though they just left And it. And I mean, if you're looking for antiques and stuff, I don't ever know whatever happened to all that stuff. But it was really great. And I'd have to take people in there. They'd have to wear masks because of the dust. You'd have pigeon droppings at a couple inch high, which we'd probably never do today because of you know, EPA and everything else. Uh, and then um, also trying to get in some of the backyards. Because when Horton did his development, next, let's go next. Let's go, uh, and these are really great fundraisers. Um, and very dress up. Next. Okay, our week to shine, 87. Next. Best of time. So when. Horton did his subdivision down here. One thing that he did not want to do because of his visits up to Los Angeles and also coming down from San Francisco is put in alleys. He felt alleys were where crime would be, where cats are, everything else. So he decided not to put any alleys here. And in doing so, created havoc for code compliance and everything else. And I'm, I'll go through here how we solved uh, some of that problems. But there were little nooks and crannies and little spaces. The building necessarily built out all. My building was 90 feet long, so I had a foot thing that was in the back and stuff. So um, it, it was kind of cool, because it gave us opportunities for second exits, although then we'd have to get easements. Everybody would have to sign off on it. That didn't really go too well, so we came up with another concept. Next. OK, next. All right. So I'm showing this. Uh, Great uh, article from San Diego Union. Well, it's not a great article. Uh, this is Mexico City, 1985. 
big gigantic earthquake hit. I had the chance to go down with John Cariotis, who was a structural engineer at that time. We spent two weeks uh, down there. He was actually hired by Holiday Inn, of all things, uh, to take a look at some of their, but we went everywhere uh, to look at that. Um, which really then started uh, the gas, the, all the unreinforced masonries, uh, and we were already working, or at least Los Angeles was already working in 1981 to come up with a seismic retrofit because of some of the earlier events. But the Mexico City triggered it, and tenants point finger at inspectors. Things. But the other thing that's kind of curious is this little side thing here. Hedgecock calls no witnesses. Prosecutor surprise as defense rest case. And Roger, uh, when he was mayor, I thought was one of the greatest supporters of the gas lamp order. I mean, he was really trying to do it. Um, he also saved uh, Horton uh, Plaza, the fountain, uh, even from, Larry, from you know, a master landscape architect like Larry Halperin. Um, so, but I think it, it was kind of a, a turning point was 85. Next. So, once we started to try to work with the building department, this is what we got. <laughs> all right. First of all, archaic materials, not reinforced. Uh, and this didn't just stop. This just didn't stop with uh, the seismic retrofit. It was also fire exiting, fireproofing, uh, fire escape access, uh, you name it, it was there. Uh, fire sprinkling of corridors and stuff, rooms that were undersized. Uh, it, and some rooms, they were even internal and had no windows. Uh, I can't imagine you would be checking into uh, your hotel room without a window, but there was a window in some of these. Next. So we decided then at that time in 1978, which was great, is that the California Historic Building Code, uh, which was called the State Historic Building Code at that time, was basically sanctioned by the, the legislation which said, okay, we were all partners back in, let's say, 1925 at the Los Angeles Alligator Farm, and we felt that we had ways that we could mitigate this, like with a leather belt on the rings and stuff. Uh, of course, this never happened today, would it? <laughs> uh, but we were all partners when the buildings were built. We did have fire codes, and we did have exiting requirements. Uh, we did have seismic stuff, and especially like in, in 1912, uh, when the Jewelers Exchange building was built, uh, it actually had reinforcing steel in it. It had, didn't have the spiral like it normally had, but it had the square, and it was sufficient enough to do it with what I consider very little retrofit. We did have to retrofit it, but little retrofit. Next. So then, this kind of opened up then a lot of great avenues for it, and <clears throat> Let's go to the next one. That's just not too good. One of the things that also came from the Historic Building Code were these rooftop signs, which were also not permitted. These great big rooftop signs that were there. And we basically petitioned that. We had to actually go up to Sacramento for a hearing at the State Historic Building Safety Board. And they said, yeah, that's appropriate. As long as it's safe, it's anchored well, and everything else. So missing the towers were reconstructed. Uh, I think Don Reeves at that time, or maybe it was Don Reeves, I can't really remember, um, also ordered the two eagles that were on top, and they were made, I think, back east somewhere. They were put on a train, and they were lost. Uh, but if you notice what you have today. Now, we did have some pretty crazy architects during that time. Uh, Don wanted to put two gigantic redwood trees in the lobby because it went all the way from the bottom to the top. Next. All right. so. One of the great things we had was Mayor Pete, Pete Wilson, uh, regardless of political uh, uh, preferences. Uh, he and Gail really wanted to make this happen. And when we held a preservation conference, when he became governor uh, in Sacramento, I introduced him as the preservation governor. And I got the biggest boo from the crowd out there for whatever reason, uh, maybe because he's Republican, I'm really not sure. But uh, they had two demonstration blocks that were sort of halfway down on Fifth Avenue, I believe. I'm trying to work this through, Mike. One was at uh, Jim Schneider's building, and the other one was at Shirley Bernard's building. 
And the reason why they were done halfway down on both ends of Fifth Avenue is so that when people are walking past and stuff, they see this activity, they see something happening that would draw them in, rather than having it right on the corner of it. Also, Jim Snyder, Shirley Bernard, uh, who own the Pacific Hotel, were very instrumental in making sure that they got things, they, they got things done and got it done correctly. Next. Okay, so one of the things that we did not have at this time as we're going through this is sidewalk dining. There were no easements even contemplated at that time. But we felt that the sidewalks being, I don't know, 14 or 15 feet wide was not wide enough to accommodate people uh, walking down the sidewalk and stuff like that. So all the sidewalks on Fifth Avenue were widened by five feet. So what you see there is not existing. Also historically, uh, especially when we got the uh, federal block grant funds, there was never any bricks on the sidewalk. By widening them, putting the curb up, and then setting the brick down allowed us to get in, although it created some havoc in getting in and out of stores. But the lamps themselves, all of these ones that you saw that have the big cobra arms, the simple thing that we found is we just cut them off, left them in place, and then put the five globe on top of them without coming up with a special design, doing wiring, and all of that. So it was a very big cost savings. So you're going to find some lamp posts that are inset on some, and then the rest of the blocks we kept the same width. Next. So it presented some challenges, again, but with the California Historic Building Code, you're allowed some small ramp transitions at that time, which you're probably not allowed now without having a handrail and stuff. So it at least allowed uh, people with disabilities to get in and around the gas transporter. Next. Also, we worked a great deal with the building department. And by the way, I got to say, through Mike's action, Mike Stetler's action with the and going down there and explaining latitude, as long as we can just make sure that it's safe, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily comply with code, but is it safe? And again, that's where California Historic Building comes through, or code comes through, is that it's performance oriented, it's not prescriptive oriented. Uh, so my attitude that I've always used is that when you're in your teens and you can run a 100 yard dash and I don't know how, well, how much they run it, seconds or whatever, no, whatever. Whatever fast you run it, by the time you're my age, you're not going to run in four seconds. So what's your best performance? You know, you're not going to kill yourself, but what is your best performance? So when we looked at the safety of this, we were allowed to take a exit out the back, because remember, we did not have any space in the back of the buildings. And especially where you have a large number of people, you have to have two exits, fire exits, enclosed in a one-hour corridor that would get you out from the third story into a stairway and then get you back out. But the problem is, is that the storefronts are very narrow. And if you then tried to build a corridor coming out, by the time you've got a five foot or four foot wide uh, space that you had to have, you would eat up so much of your ground floor space uh, for your commercial use. So they allowed us to go down back into the basement, which most of the basements were not used, and then build the corridor here and then out, out there. So that saved a tremendous amount of space on the ground floor, but still provided that same level of safety. Next. They also allowed us for fire escapes where we had wooden windows and everything else, where we had fire escapes coming down. They allowed us to keep the drop ladder because at that time, if you're putting in a new fire escape, it required a counterbalance counter system. These are these great things that as you walk out on them, they go and come down to the ground. They're super ugly, they're huge and everything else. We're allowed to do the drop ladder. And then better yet, if we put in here wire glass uh, and make sure that it was stopped in, it could still be operable uh, up to 10 feet, uh, then we're able to use the existing fire escape on that. So these things were really great economics of making these buildings work and also trying to keep them looking a little bit better. 
Okay, so then we started getting the encroachments and the restaurants coming out. And I think, you know, Laurie and I walked in the, the gas lamp today, and I'm not going to get into whether signs are complying, because David already did that. He went and shot all the buildings, so I'm not, I'm not sure what you're going to do with it. But anyway, you got it, you got it going. Uh, one thing we notice is that the gas lamp is so alive. I mean, um, of course, there's like a jillion restaurants. Uh, but it is really alive, but there was a great controversy on how we put out these areas for outdoor dining. And I think it was with Michael's effort that we came up with a certain amount of space where you had to walk around light posts, or this or that, or back preventers or whatever. So when you go out there, you find these funny little zigzaggies, circle things, and all of that. You know, it's not straight. And Everybody wanted to have a presence on the outdoor dining. Uh, Croce's, Inger Croce was just a complete lifesaver in bringing a new blood to the gas tank quarter. Uh, wife, Jim Croce, um, had his picture on the inside there. Uh, but I remember the junkyard dog. The, the, the back. A you know, gas lamp at that time looked really crappy, but you know I'm in a junkyard and no going to touch. So that was a very fun relationship. Next. Okay, so we had tiny problems, obviously. Next. Uh, also, the Horton Grand Hotel um, was geared to be uh, demolished. You, you've heard the story on that. You've heard of the story. Uh, this was before, though, uh, before the National Park Service. Uh, basically ended up with revising uh, their standard and coming up with reconstruction. They did not have reconstruction uh, before we tackled this project in, in the early 80s. Um, they, they didn't really believe in reconstruction. They still don't believe in reconstruction. Uh, so, but the only way that we could do this, we could not move it in total. It's all unreinforced masonry. It was, it was just not possible. So we had to take it apart piece by piece. Some pictures out there where the thing is lifted off and, uh, and uh, Vince Claus, who was my first employee, um, was standing on the top and we, be, we formed 16 penny construction in the gas lamp quarter. So I, I was fortunate enough that I could design and, and with the help of staff and then also become the contractor. That little horse right there is sitting out in the lobby. That's a mm -hmm. fake horse. And Tom Mex and all the movie stars used to get their saddles made here, and the bottom of it's all filled with lead uh, so that you can put your foot in a stirrup and swing up there. So if you want to get on, ask somebody, and you can, it won't come over on you, I hope. <laughs> I hope it won't come over on you. Anyway, we took it down piece by piece. The Nikel Saddle Rebuilding, uh, <clears throat> which is the one next door, was also going to be demolished. I can't remember who was going to do it. I don't know whether the Salvation Army Building or whatever, I can't remember. But they're going to demolish it, so uh, Dan Pearson, the developer, got the building for a buck, so we took it. Now, one of the interesting things is a great video that we had because we had city council members, we had CCDC, everybody watching this, a big event because Dan Pearson was married to Kit Goldman and, and uh, who was an uh, actress and also uh, did a couple of theater for her. Uh, wanted to have this shot, but it's the first time we ever did it, so we had to hooked on to this pod here, and we're pulling it like you can't believe. It's not coming loose. And uh, Dan's circling and waving, saying, you know, get going with this because we don't want to lose the media and everything else. So the crane pulled hard on it, and there was a whole bunch of bolts we didn't find that was into the brick. So bricks went flying across the walkway, and everybody's scattering and everything else. So then when we did the Kelp Saddlery, we staged it. We went there. It all disconnected and everything out, then put it back in its place. And then all the stuff was ready. We're going bang, bang, bang with our hammers and saws and all that kind of making all this noise and say, ready? It was awesome. great. So, <laughs> next. So, here's uh, Dan Pearson and Kit Goldman. Uh, they got and they're uh, responsible not only for uh, putting these two projects together, also working with the Grand Pacific. And also the theater next door, which is a reconstruct, which is just, uh, it's a new building to make, make look old. Uh, so they were very instrumental. 
Dan actually started, I believe, working for the loan department on projects with the city, then later became a development. Next. Okay, then we had <coughs> major problems with some of the, with some of the big high rise. Again, uh, the old Jewelry's Exchange Building, uh, before it was painted, uh, the offices here, Dennis's offices and everything else, Jeweler's office, of course, things like that. Uh, a person by the name of James, James Watt? Anyway, uh, this was real uh, popular for timeshares during this period when timeshares were being built. And urban timeshares were really great. And especially for timeshares that had Sundays, what they call Sunday, Sunday. Sunday. So San Diego was a great sun day. Like, great sun day. Okay, uh, Fargo is not a great Sunday city, okay? So he wanted to do uh, an urban uh, um, timeshare. Uh, so we had to retrofit this with steel, and we had to lift the steel all the way up to the top and lower it all the way down in the pieces. And as we put the pieces in, uh, bolt them together. So it was a real thing. I'm a firm believer of seismic retrofit should not be seen. Uh, you should be able to walk into the building the best you can and not be able to, uh, to see the seismic uh, retrofit. Next. Uh, we also had glass doors here and corridors, so a lot of these then got curtains and false backs uh, to make sure that we uh, uh, would, would keep the, the corridor free and all of that sort of stuff. So, but it looks like it was original and it's also fully uh, fire sprinkled as well. Next. And then special things like with drop curtains in the lobby so that if the fire started to shut down, instead of having some sort of doors, the fire curtain would drop down so you could, so you could get out of there. So when you're in the lobbies and you're there, it looks like the original, although it complies uh, with, the, with the particular safety codes. And a beautiful marble, March marble and stuff. Next. Now, most of these buildings that were, that were purchased by what I call the modern people, the modern developers, us, and then they didn't spend very much. I know that Bud Fisher, I think he paid like $120,000 for the Bequestro building. Uh, we had other people paying $6,000 for their building. Um, I mean, even when I bought my building many years later, I only paid $340,000 and I sold it for $1.2 so, I mean, these are great values when you're looking at early, but, but the problem was anything south of Broadway, you could not get a loan at that time. The banks were not giving you loans on these buildings. So if you had cash, like Bud Fisher and, and, uh, and Chris Morrison and stuff, you could buy up a lot of buildings if you had it and then wait for it. Uh, so that's the first thing. The other thing to answer your question, was when we're seismic zones. There's four, and I, I, I'm not going to dwell on this because I don't want people to glaze over and stuff. But there's four seismic, seismic zones. Um, seismic zone four is the worst. And what that requires that when you retrofit a building, that you can only allow, once it, you make it strong enough, so you can only have so much drift which means when it moves through is that it's got to be rigid enough so it doesn't come apart. And then you have to anchor all the parts that could come apart, uh, whether it's embellishment or, or stuff like this and everything else. San Diego had been in seismic zone two for many, many, many years uh, and portions of the county. Um, then it, it trans to uh, when the Rose Canyon Fault was found, then it went to seismic zone three. Uh, in most of the county. And when uh, Maureen O'Connor, is it O'Connor or O'Connor? No, O'Connor is the sailor, O'Connor, Maureen O'Connor. When she became uh, supervisor for the county, she put the rest of the county in seismic zone four. And then when she became mayor, she put the city in the seismic zone four. So we came up with what we called a site specific spectra, which means you look at the site and what it's going to tell you in a geographical thing in terms of its movement, its drift, 
and stuff under a certain level of quakes. And you use that as a design criteria. We also allowed in the State Historic Building Code to basically go to earlier codes for the seismic retrofit. And again, this is based on empirical values and everything else. We're not making it less safe. And we used to get that a lot from the structural engineers, is that you're putting people in unsafe buildings. You're, you're holding them hostage. But that's not the case. So those two things, the, the tax credits, looking at how we can actually do the retrofit for the site-specific area and what that means, uh, really, I think, led to it. And I got to tell you again, the building department was very, very good in doing this. We got a lot of engineers on board when we wrote the ordinance and everything else. So if you have to do seismic retrofit uh, of a building like this, and you, you can't use seismic retrofit, it's not like putting in new carpets and drapes and everything else, which, by the way, the historic tax credits also paid for the soft costs. They paid for architects' fees and contractors' fees and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, when, but when you add that in, it was getting really easy to spend more than the basis of the value. So it was not a problem at that time. But these, uh, these faults, so they, they're, they're called active because something happened in the last 11,000 years. Uh, longer than that. Same yeah. with all the Rose Creek. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So isn't it statistically a waste of money to do this in San Diego? Well, you know, it's that old thing. Are you in the 7,000 year or the 11,000 year? That type of deal. Um, well, that was the fight. And, and I think that at least what saved, uh, and a lot of other buildings that are not in the gas lamp quarter too, were able to use that. And then we wrote it into the California Historic Building Code. So it became statewide, uh, which is really good. Uh, so, but then, you know, uh, like when you're looking at Northridge earthquake, Northridge is a quake that we haven't really experienced before in California. It was a thrust quake, which means it moved up from the, from the earth rather than rolling across. And all the, the uh, concrete freeways, you know, that came down and blasted a hole through them and people were killed and everything else. That's why you saw all the retrofits of all the columns and the wraps and stuff on it. So, um, but one thing we did find is that when you go to city council and you're begging for city council, and you're dealing with code items and safety, they will not, not back you on that. It's not, because it's really not their job to do that, all right? That's not a political thing when it comes to safety. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so this is the uh, old city hall building, uh, built in 1874. Doesn't look like it, though, does it? Uh, most of the buildings in the United States in the 1950s went through what they called a beautification movement, uh, which means they cladded them and made them look modern. You know, what we're calling mid-century modern today. Uh, made them clean up and everything else. Uh, I believe the old city hall uh, uh, chambers and everything was on the top floor, right? Uh, which was really cool uh, because the other thing that we did code, and I think this building started it because it was, um, we're looking at about 1980, just before the tax year thing, but one of the great things that we found, which was really super, and again, uh, uh, kudos to the building department, is they were saying, okay, you can't have this up there, that's not what its use is today, so therefore if you want to change it, you go to more hazardous use where you have an occupancy use on the top floor rather than just an office use, then you're gonna to have to bring the whole building up to code. So we worked to deal with them. We said, okay, look, when these buildings were first built, they had in mind the design, the exiting, the strength, and everything else on that. So again, we're partners. I mean, there was a building department at this time that approved that building. Uh, so we're partners of that. If we, can, if we can prove any prior use, whether it's restaurant use, theater use, high assembly, like city hall use, office use, any, any other kind of use, uh, can we then put that use back? And of course, it would be a different client or a different um, whatever you want to call it coming in. But can we put that use back in? And they said yes. Now, we had a big case that we had to go through in order to do that, uh, but they said yes. So what that did then is it made a whole nother set called researchers, <laughs> historical researchers, because they would start going through 
advertisements, newspapers, catalogs, uh, postcards, I mean anything that where you could show on a building that was a particular use, they would allow us to put that use back into the building. Isn't that cool? Next. So, guess what? Um, they started to peel this off, off of the building, and look what they found. Now some of it's been scored, but look at the columns. Still in place because, guess what? It's cheaper to just cover up something than it is to try to demolish it, fix it, and clean it up, and, and modernize it. In other words, they could have tried to fill all this in and strip it and, and do all that, build something across here, but it's just easier to cover it up. Next. So isn't that gorgeous? Next. Okay, that's the finished building. Next. Yeah. We did a similar building, I think, the Bank of, of Commerce or something up on uh, Hillcrest that was covered with 1960s sunblocks and stuff. And we looked at some historic photographs, did the same thing, and, and, and found, found everything. Next. Uh, we changed our offices several times. Um, which was really great. I'm going to just tell you a small story on this. Again, it was a code item. Um, we were on the upper floor, which was wide open. Um, on the third floor, again, stairs only, only stairs, no elevator. And uh, we were remodeling it, getting it all to go. And one thing that was always a problem with doing the historic tax credits is you had to get the doggone projects done before December 31st because everybody wanted to get their, get their credit in that year. Uh, so you had to put the building in use, and that in use was very, very wishy-washy, flexible. But you had to have a tenant, you had to serve food if that was the case, so you had to put it in the whole building in use, but you had to get it in use. Uh, so we were trying to finish out uh, the top floor to get this going. During the process, um, which really kind of shows how we weren't thinking very well, is we decided to remove all the plaster because most of it had leaky roofs, the plaster was falling down, and you had all these great timbers and all the framing. It looked really cool, you know, for an architect's office. I thought it was really going to be good. In fact, we were even thinking about sandblasting until the preservation brief about not sandblasting came out, and we didn't do that. But we thought it was really cool, so we removed all, moved all the plaster ceiling. Now, when you do that, it means then that your roof is not compliant because it is not protected from fire. Now, if you fire sprinkle the building, uh, we found that the fire sprinkling would buy you a lot of, a lot of goodwill if you fire sprinkled your building. And at that time, fire sprinkling was not very expensive. It was about a dollar a square foot. So when you're looking at the greater things, uh, it was a fairly cheap thing to do. But the building wasn't fire sprinkled, and we weren't even thinking of fire sprinkling at that time. So we were rushing through, rushing through, rushing through. And uh, my contractors were working almost around the clock uh, to try to get this done. And we're getting everything done. And so we had all the drywall pretty much done. Uh, and they don't care about paint and all of that. They just care about the nailing pattern and making sure that the mud's there. So we're about two weeks out. And I'm thinking, man, I'm really feeling good. We're going to make this done. So. Um, I can't remember the inspector, Michael, but we became good friends after this. Um, in fact, we worked on the Naval Training Center, I think, 20 years later. Um, but anyway, <laughs> he's really a funny guy. Uh, so anyway, we tried, to do, we tried to do the nailing on this, and um, he was tired, he was sweaty, he was hot, and everything else. And, um, and so we're trying to get this done. We're getting close to 5 o'clock. It's about 4 o'clock. I, I really need you to sign off on the nailing pattern so I can come back in and put all the drywall mud on and stuff, let it dry, and then we're good to go. Uh, we get our permit. And uh, it, he was tired, so and, and you know after walking three flights of stairs, so he says, "Look, I'll come back tomorrow." And I said, "I can't do that. I really got to do it." Yada, da, da. So anyway, he walked down the stairs, <clears throat> walked outside, and I'm chasing after him. I'm saying, "Please come back. Please come back." And it's hotter than crap, even though it's in, in December. And he says, no, and I just got furious. So I called up the building department, and I said, your inspector told me that he's not going to haul his ass back up those stairs. And uh, he says, will you wait by the phone, Mr. Donaldson? So the guy comes into the thing, and 
And he says, did you tell Mr. Donaldson you're not going to haul your ass back up the stairs? And he says, yes. And he says, you go back and haul your ass up the stairs <laughs> and do that. That was a mistake on my part. <laughs> Big mistake. So he came in and he took his tape out. And they're supposed to be 10 inches on center for the nailing. If it was like 10 and a quarter, the guy there would nail and nail and nail and nail. He says, OK, fine, I'll be back tomorrow. So he comes back tomorrow. Uh, Let's see, I think I might have a, no, never mind. Uh, let's change the picture anyway. You've seen that. OK. So he comes back the next day, and he says, oh, by the way, Mr. Donaldson, uh, this building's not sprinkled, is it? And I go, no. And he says, uh, you need to have a Type X, 5H Type X, uh, some fireboard up there, nailed off and taped before I can sign off on this. And I go, oh. So anyway, we did it. We worked around the clock and uh, finally did it. So I learned a big lesson in that. You never get an inspector. <laughs> okay. All right, next. OK, so um, we're just about ready to end here. Um, this is Armin Viora. Uh, these are some images from Mike's book on the gas lamp quarter. Uh, Armin was really great. Uh, the reason why I show this is, is he inherited uh, this uh, shot from his uncle in 1927. I think he died in 1996 or 97 or something like that. This picture is actually just one year before he passed away. But we had so many of these people in the gas lamp quarter that ran these little shops and everything else. And the unfortunate thing is they got gentrified out when the rent started to go up and everything. You could walk into the gas lamp quarter and get a $1.25 meal that you would pay 15 bucks for now. You had to make sure that the hookers wouldn't bother you and all that. And I continued to make the same mistakes. Uh, I was, we had a lot of homeless there. Uh, one thing we found is the building department would not arrest anybody if they were on your property. And most of the doorways had insets in them because the doors couldn't swing out over onto the public sidewalk. So what would happen is that when a police would come down, because uh, we were lucky to get a walking uh, patrol down here, uh, we had to kind of take a little hook and pull the guy's foot over onto the public property, and then he could take him out. But otherwise, he couldn't, he couldn't touch him. Uh, but a lot of these guys that were down here had these, these uh, wonderful, wonderful shops. Isn't that a great picture? All his keys and everything, old calendars. Next. OK, so we did a uh, kind of a new place for him when he was there. The Patrick's two. What, no, go back. The Patrick's two. Uh, we had a, a bad fire uh, next door. The Keating Building's over here, and what was uh, uh, Hard Rock uh, was another one. That's a great Chris Mortensen building. Uh, but we were lucky to maintain these very, very small, uh, twenty-five foot wide openings uh, in order to uh, have bars and stuff in there. And Larry and his wife, you know, you get to know these people over the years. They're great. Uh, both of them drank like a fish when they had a bar, so that kind of worked uh, for them. But the, the, the friendship was just great. Next. Uh, we also had some great professionals come down, the Wilmer Yamada Landscape and Associates. Next. Uh, we had uh, 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 Ben Nakop. He, he came up with his own private police, uh, which was a real hassle. Let me tell you, he was actually in one of the buildings that we were renting. He came up with the same uniforms and everything else, but he was private police, but for a person just walking along the street. And they don't arrest people. That was not the deal. It was to help them, but you had to pay for a subscription. So if you had somebody hustling, like uh, some of the homeless or whatever else, then, then uh, you had them. Next. Any home garden was down there for a while. Uh, uh, this was the dance floor and stuff I was talking about, the third floor on the San Diego uh, Hardware Building. Just wonderful, wonderful spaces. Next. OK, so Mike's going to love this. Um, we had a lot of murals in and around uh, the neighborhood. A lot of graffiti, of course, and stuff. But the murals, we felt, especially from uh, the Latino heritage, was really important to have. And as you know, um, uh, just recently, uh, we had a very good success uh, that came out from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. 
which was the Coronado Bridge. Uh, Chicago. You have all the murals. A lot of money came in, and it was, they were all restored, including using the artists. So we felt we should have a murals program in San Diego, and we did. We went out and, uh, and asked for people to go ahead and submit stuff. Five murals. Uh, this one here is uh, on the Brunswick Drug Building. Uh, what's that? No, I'm going to get there. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Mike Ferris, who owned the building. Uh, Bruce Damon, who is his architect. Where's Bruce? I can't see Bruce. Anyway, he was the architect. And then some of his investor friends and everything else. So, you know, fake window. Uh, but wonderful mural on uh, Really ugly mural, but it was chosen. Uh, freeway interchange. Kind of... Uh, a little inset next. But we got holy crap from the Latino community. Not one Latino artist, all, uh, especially like, um, his name Torero, I can't remember his first Mario name. Torero. Mario Torero was one of the nation's best murals artists. We're not even selected in the finals. And stuff. So they raised holy havoc on this. Uh, we still went ahead and did it. Next. Um, this is the mural that's on the side of the Callan Hotel, uh, which is really goofy. Uh, this is uh, Heidi Harden. She was the artist, Lady in Red, or Lady of the Night, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is me in a sailor's uniform, uh, some street people. And Tom Hom, which I didn't get in this shot, I couldn't find it. Tom Hom is holding his baby girl in his arm, and then when his baby girl was 12 years old, is standing next to him. So, so that so your daughter is represented twice in it. Now, none of these murals have lapsed; they're all gone. In fact, this right here looks like this now. Oh, missed it. Go ahead. Okay, well, anyway, if you look at the Callan Hotel, they've cut windows in it and it's and they're gone. So all the mural program is gone. I think part of the spinoff that was also uh, is that even though uh, Plaza Fountain was not in uh, the gas lamp quarter designed by Irving Gill in 1910 to celebrate the opening of the, uh, of the hotel, uh, had kind of gone to ruins. It was kind of uh, the homeless park and everything else. And uh, during the port where Ernie Hahn was doing the, uh, his plaza, he actually wanted to take that fountain and remove it and put it in the well that's in the Horton Plaza that you find now. And he hired Larry Halpern to come up with a Larry, typical Larry Halpern design, which was a bunch of scalings and a clock tower and everything else. A very important uh, place uh, here, especially with Irving Gill being the designer. Uh, Kate Sessions doing the landscaping on it. Um, so there was a big movement, and uh, we basically saved it uh, from that. Uh, and I think Roger Hedgecock was mayor at the time, I believe. And uh, Larry Halpern came down and gave a presentation uh, with Save Our Heritage Organization. We gave a presentation, and basically Larry Halpern uh, who is a very renowned, world-renowned uh, landscape architect. He passed away a few years ago. He did the Sea Ranch and stuff. He basically shouted out some uh, uh, four-letter words as he left the city called the Pipsqueak Park and all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty funny uh, when he left. Next. So anyway, CCDC uh, had a lot of pro internal problems on it, but basically went ahead and restored it uh, to its grandeur today. I had thought at one time, uh, doing some more research, and I, I was wrong. I, one of the things that was um, was the water spray. And by the, this was a, the electric fountain uh, east of the Mississippi. So when they threw the switch on it, because it had a whole series of different lights, colored lights that went through it, which I think they, they still do. Uh, everybody's standing across the street, because you never knew what was going to happen. But I thought there was like a little areometer that was up here. It's, it's shown on Gill's drawings. It's not here. And uh, at least I was told that, but, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm wrong on that now. 
but as the areometer would spin faster because the wind was blowing, because one of the chief objections is that the water was splashing over onto the thing and making it slippery and dangerous, is that as that would spin more, the water pressure would go down. So the wind wouldn't blow it, and then when it was still, it would come back up. But I think I'm wrong on that, because I couldn't see it anywhere on that on his drawing there, from his original drawing. Okay, so I think the gas lamp quarter, if you really look at it, that's where we've been over the years. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my employee who is now how old? 40? Yeah. <laughs> late, 50s. Late, late 50s. Okay, so Stuart is actually, the, I think he came on when he was 19 years old into the office. He's the third employee. He, I think he can lay claim to be the longest continuous modern architect in the gas lamp quarter, right? <laughs> so, I mean, many of the, uh, the names that we gave people uh, over the years next. Uh, we also had celebrated, a, this is my brother right here, we celebrated a 40th uh, um, birthday. Uh, so my guys right there uh, went out and hired a, a male dancer and a just to show that gas lamp's still alive. <laughs> My brothers doesn't know what to do about it. Next. All right, so I, I think it's really great. I know we've had problems, uh, especially with the Mardi Gras in the past years, and I'm a, I'm a member of Eclampus Vitus, and we had our fire truck and was followed by Ho Hooter. And so, you know, we, we've always had fun and stuff, but I, I think it's all manageable. You know, it keeps going. And a lot of the people, you know, like Beverly Schroeder and Pam Hamilton and Max Schmidt and all these wonderful people from CCDC helping us down the line, especially Mike Stepner, all, all with us all the time. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't have happened. And I, I couldn't find my old slides. You know, all those pictures are in slides. And, I, you know, and I'm trying to find them and they're, they're getting kind of old. But we took pictures. We we're going to do a book of the people of the gas lamp quarter. And I still have these pictures somewhere, they're not gone. And Lori can attest to that because I'm going to throw anything away. Uh, but we had names for them. We had like Dirty Frank, and I know that Mike remembers Dirty Frank. Uh, we, uh, ben and his wife actually tried to, to rehabilitate him. He was a street person. Uh, he knew how to fix cars, it was great. In fact, we would tow cars to him, and he would get them started and fixed up. And we said, Frank, why don't you just get it? No, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't rehab him all the way. But we had guys like uh, Mr. No-Nose. Uh, he didn't have a front nose, but he had a piece of tape across it. Mr. No-Neck, this was a guy that was bent over so much that when he passed you, he didn't have a head. <laughs> all you saw was shoulders. Uh, cowboy, radio man. Uh, which is great. We have Propeller Man. This guy wore a little beanie hat with a propeller, and he would walk the streets every morning picking up trash in a, in a thing and trying to clean up the trash and all the 15 milliliter bottles and, and all of that. Which, by the way, we did. We were lucky enough, and uh, um, was it Martinez? I can't remember. Evaldo Martinez. Evaldo Martinez. When he was a city council member, he was instrumental in helping us clean up the 15 uh, milliliter um, uh, bottles, you know, the Thunderbird and the Mad Dog and Mad Dog 2020 and all those fortified wines and stuff by getting rid of them in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in all of the liquor stores and stuff. And uh, he was really great at doing that. He just uh, had other problems of eating too much and stuff and charging the wrong things. But, but, he was, but he was really great. I think everybody that came here uh, was, more than, was more than instrumental. But we still didn't get a lot of the bars to stop serving the shot glasses for 25 cents of beer, you know, these kind of things, which just doesn't help the situation uh, on it. Next. So here we are. Uh, I had to take that off of that. I didn't have a good one. I didn't have a chance to shoot. So thank you so much. It's still the historic heart of San Diego. And doing your thing. <laughs>